this is the first time I've given a virtual lecture, so um, let's hope it all goes well. Albrecht's method is an old method, but I want to talk about some new developments that have just come up in the last few months about Albrecht's method. So um, a fundamental engineering problem is to stabilize, as several people have pointed out, stabilize a plan to an operating point. If we have a finite dimensional control differential equation, uh, I'm going to take n as the state dimension, m as the control dimension. Uh, and if we assume that this function f is smooth, then we can expand it at least through linear terms. And then posing and solving a linear quadratic regulated problem will yield a locally stabilizing linear feedback. So what is an LQR? We all know this, but let me just run through it again because we're going to uh, see this several times in infinite dimensions. We choose a n by n, n plus m by n plus m matrix uh, such that the whole matrix is positive, non-negative definite, and the lower right-hand corner R is positive definite. And we minimize this quadratic form in Z and U. I'm using Z as a state variable because later I'm going to get to infinite dimensions and X is going to be a, a physical variable. Um, we have linear dynamics and a given initial condition. So if they exist, we expect the optimal cost to be a quadratic form in the initial condition, and the optimal feedback will be a linear function of the current state. Uh, they, the P and the K satisfy the familiar LQR equations. The first one is called the Riccati, algebraic Riccati equation. Um, the function Z transpose PZ is a Lyapunov function. That's one of the main reasons for using optimal control to stabilize, is you automatically get a, a, a Lyapunov function for the closed loop system. So let's assume the system now is nonlinear. And let's expand uh, this, the time derivative of this function through terms of order two. Uh, you can see that it is non-negative definite. And so we have possibly a Lyapunov proof of stability in some small region around the origin. Just how big the region is uh, depends on the particular nonlinearities in F. Now, the LQR equations can be derived from the HJB equations, but there is a conceptually simpler method that I want to use because I don't want to get into the complications of HJB in infinite dimensions. It's called completing the square. So uh, if we have some trajectory, uh, if there is any trajectory that is absolute, uh, asymptotically stabilizing from Z0, uh, then if we choose any symmetric P matrix P, we have this identity. And if we expand it out a little bit, it takes this form. So this is zero. So we can add this to the criterion to be minimized and get a more complicated looking criterion that is actually simpler in, in practice. Uh, we choose K so that the integrand is a perfect square of the form that you see. and um, this requires these two equations to be satisfied. And as we all know, these are essentially the same as the LQR equations. Then the optimal cost starting from Z0 is one half Z0 transpose P0, Z0. And the optimal feedback is U equals K of T. You see, if we complete the square in this fashion, then all this term, this integrand is zero. And so the criteria to be minimized is this, and there is no minim, there's no minim variable to minimize over, so that guarantees that it's the optimal cost through. Now, let's turn to a nonlinear problem. We're, we're minimizing a non-quadratic Lagrangian subject to nonlinear dynamics in an initial condition. Now, Albrecht assumed that the dynamics and the Lagrangian are sufficiently smooth to have Taylor polynomial expansions. We expand F through terms of degree D and L through terms of degree D plus one. Typically D plus one is even because we want to have a positive definite or non-negative definite Lagrangian. That uh, superscript uh, in the square brackets K indicates terms homogeneous of degree K 
in the arguments Z and U. The higher degree terms in the Lagrangian might be penable ter penalty terms used to enforce state and control constraints. And the quadratic Lagrangian is an even function and the linear dynamics is an odd function. We break that even odd symmetry when we go to higher degree terms and that may be desirable in some situations when the, uh, when the actual system is not symmetric. Albrecht assumed that the optimal cost and the optimal feedback are sufficiently smooth to have Taylor polynomial expansions also, this time only in the variable Z. And he plugged these into the HJV PDEs and collected terms of light degrees. At lowest degrees, he obtained the familiar LQR equations for P and K. At higher degrees, he obtained a sequence of linear equations for the K plus first part of the optimal cost and the case part of the uh, optimal feedback. And um, these equations are triangular. The, the, the K plus one part of the optimal cost is in its own equation without the optimal feedback of degree K. And uh, so we first solved that equation. And it turns out that if the matrix F plus GK, that's the closed loop linear uh, closed loop um, linear part of the dynamics is Hurwitz, then uh, the equations that Albrecht got have a unique solution. Now, let me, let me show you how that works because we'll do, we want to do it again in infinite dimensions. So let's first do it in a toy problem. So we assume that the optimal cost through degree three looks like this. We've already found P and pi three is some, quad, uh, some cubic homogeneous cubic polynomial in Z. Uh, we assume that there is some trajectory, control trajectory that does the stabilization that we want. And we just plug that in. And this is just the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. We add this to the cost to the criterion to be minimized just as we did before. And uh, if pi, we find out that if pi three satisfies this linear equation, it's linear in pi three, even though there are quadratic and cubic terms, it, it's linear in the coefficients of pi three. And uh, the only thing that is unknown is the first term in there, the partial of pi three with respect to Z times the closed loop linear dynamics. The other terms have already been computed, K, we've already computed K at the quadratic linear quadratic level, and uh, F2 and L3 are data from the problem. So then the optimal cost through cubic terms, if we can satisfy this equation, then the integrand of this integral becomes zero, and the optimal cost just becomes the sum of these two terms through cubic terms. Now, we, I mentioned before the solvability of these equations. In order to solve these equations, we need to know that this operator that takes a cubic polynomial into a cubic polynomial, scalar-valued cubic polynomial to a scalar-valued cubic polynomial, is uh, invertible. Now, the eigenvalues of this operator are the sums of three eigenvalues of mu i uh, of f plus g k, and the corresponding eigenvectors are just these triple products uh, where w i, w j, and w k are left eigenvectors of f plus g k. So, if we take the matrix w of all the left eigenvalues of f plus g k, then this linear change of coordinates from z to zeta diagonalizes this equation. And so we can solve it term by term in effect for each one of these terms, okay? And that's an important fact. Now the quadratic part of the optimal cost does not show up in these equations. Uh, and we have to go to the HJB equations to fix the quadratic part of the optimal cost. And here's what it turns out to be. So after we solve for pi three, we can solve for kappa two. That's the triangular nature of these equations. Everything else is stuff we already solved for or data that came from the problem. 
So at higher degrees, it doesn't look very different. Uh, at the K plus first degree, uh, we have uh, the partial of pi K plus one with respect to uh, the directional derivative of pi K plus one in the direction of the closed loop linear dynamics is known stuff. And once we've solved that, we can solve the second equation because we always assume that R is an invertible matrix, a positive definite matrix, in fact. Um, and again, the linear change of coordinates not only diagonalizes at degree three, it diagonalizes at all degrees. So Albrecht's method is designed for a special class of problems. These are smooth, infinite horizon, optimal control problems with no active constraints at the operating points and whose linear quadratic part satisfies the standard LQR conditions. And, but the nice thing about Ulbricht is it works, and it works in dimensions higher than three. And there aren't, to my knowledge, any other methods for this class of problems that can guarantee uh, a pretty good solution, a pretty a lar uh, a local solution, admittedly, but in, on a large, relatively large domain in dimensions above three. And three is even questionable for many methods. Uh, there are quick and robust solvers for LQR problems. MATLAB's uh, control systems toolbox is very good at solving Mercati equations. And then MATLAB is also very good at solving linear equations. So it, it's a relatively easy method, somewhat complicated in notation, but not complicated in, in concept. Now it only yields a local solution and it su assumes that there are no active constraints but it can be used as a warm start. And uh, I was thinking of cheese talk this morning. Uh, this, this local solution could be a use, a warm start for uh, patchy methods, fast marching methods, uh, and various other kinds of methods, sparse grist methods, and so on. And these methods perhaps can handle the state and control constraints. Now, one drawback of Albrecht's method is once you get above degree two in the Taylor expansion of pi of z, there's no guarantee that the Taylor polynomial would be positive definite or even non-negative definite. In fact, it's probably unlikely that it happens. But we have come up with a technique for completing the square. So we add higher degree terms. We stop it. Uh, the, we, we compute Albrecht to degree d plus one in the optimal cost. And then we add extra terms up to degree 2d, and we wind up with the sum of squares, and we know that it is at least non-negative definite and probably positive definite. Um, Albrecht's method actually is a, it, with this modification, this completing the squares modification, is an excellent choice for the terminal cost in a model predictive control scheme. And an MPC scheme can handle the state and control constraints. Of course, and to be honest with you, the, the way the MPC straight scheme handles the state and control constraints is to throw them over the top to the nonlinear program solver. But the, our, community, the, uh, our colleagues in the nonlinear programming community have come up with very effective algorithms for solving. Um, and, what we found, it, there's no guarantee, but what we found in, in examples is that the Albrecht approximations give larger and larger basins of asymptotic stability that can be proven by Lyapunov means than the, just the quadratic approximations. And this allows an NPA, NPC scheme to have a shorter horizon. That's important because the complexity of the problems that the NPC scheme is passing to the solver are largely dictated by the, uh, the horizon length. And if we can get that horizon length down fairly short, then uh, we can solve for faster dynamical systems. I mean, remember MPC came out of the chemical processing community where time constants are minutes, hours, even days sometimes. The corresponding Albrecht approximation to the optimal feedback can be used in an, what I call adaptive horizon model predictive control. So not only do you have the optimal cost, approximation of the optimal cost to be useful, but the optimal feedback. An adaptive horizon model predictive control is a scheme for figuring out 
whether the current horizon in your MPC scheme is long enough to guarantee asymptotic stability. And what you do is you just project the trajectories returned by the nonlinear program solver a few extra time instants forward using the optimal feedback, the all the approximation to the optimal feedback. And as you project, you verify any control and uh, state constraints are satisfied, and you also verify that the Lyapunov conditions are satisfied. If they are, then you're happy with your current horizon length. If they're comfortably satisfied, you may even reduce the horizon length. If they're not satisfied, you increase the horizon length. Now, Albrecht's method actually has uh, many abstentions. Uh, Kamalisa and Nabaska extended it to discrete time, infinite horizon, optimal control problems. Uh, it looks very much the same. Uh, the directional differentiation operator is replaced by uh, composition with the linear closed loop dynamics operator. Um, we've expanded Albrecht's method to some stochastic infinite horizon optimal control problems in both continuous and discrete time. The sum means uh, that the coefficient of the noise terms in the stochastic optimal control problem, the coefficient, say, of the noise term in the Edo equation, has to be order xu. It has to vanish at the operating point. Of course, not every problem is that way, but if, if the the uncertainties arise because of uncertainties in the parameters of the system, that that's the kind of noise that you will have. Uh, Albrecht's method can be expanded to discrete time problems over finite horizons. Uh, what happens there is the different, uh, the linear, linear, uh, the linear algebraic equations are, are replaced by linear differential or difference equations. And of course, the differential and difference equations are explicit equations. So in fact, there are some ways that are easier to solve than the algebraic Riccati equations. And Albrecht's method also works for differential games and hamilton jacobi isaacs equations. Uh, and for finding Lyapunov functions, uh, it's sometimes called Zuboff's method in that context. So I've coded it up, uh, and if anybody is interested, I will send them the routines. It is not as user-friendly as I would like to be, but there are some templates for optimal stabilization, optimal regulation, and otherwise you can use. The software is fast. Chi uh, talked about the six-dimensional attitude of a rigid body. We, we attacked the 12-dimensional attitude and position of a rigid body, we computed the tail of polynomials of the optimal cost to degree four and the optimal feedback to degree three in less than five seconds. And the range of validity of this solution is at least one radian in each of the Euler angles. So it is a fairly large region for which the Lyapunov stability is guaranteed. When we go to uh, the next degree up, you want to always go to an even degree in the optimal cost because you want it to be positive, non-negative definite at least. Uh, if we go to degree six in the cost and degree five in the feedback, uh, then there are a lot of monomials, 100,000 monomials in the 18 control and state variables. And uh, the computer that I'm working from right now, it's a, it's a three or four year old Mac Pro uh, took about 30 minutes to solve this problem. And the reason it took so long was that it had to swap things in and out of virtual memory. So now let's go to the, that, all that's old stuff. Let's go to the new stuff. So consider a controlled nonlinear reaction diffusion equation. You see it there. Uh, the diffusion term is the, DC, uh, the Laplacian there, one dimensional Laplacian and the reaction term is the F term. Uh, I'm going to put Neumann boundary conditions on, but I could have put uh, Dirichlet conditions or mixed conditions. Uh, and uh, these are no flux boundary conditions. The, we could do this in vector values, but you're going to see the notation is horrendous even in scalar cases. 
But conceptually, there's no reason why what I'm about to discuss doesn't go to vector value situation. The reaction term is a functional of the state. The state now is this infinite dimensional state. The function uh, x goes to z of x and t. And the control is a second infinite dimensional object. U goes to x control of t. Uh, or we could have point control, but uh, right now I'm going to take some sort of distributed control. <coughs> we assume that these nonlinearities the linearities and the nonlinearities are given by Fred Holm expressions. So this is the linear part of the dynamics. This is the quadratic part of the dynamics. This is the cubic part of the dynamics. And we assume these expressions are symmetric in the subscripted in, 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 integers, the subscript in the subscripted xi's. This is not the most reaction, most general term we could take. We could have terms quadratic in U or bilinear in U and Z or higher degrees in C and U. But to keep this talk relatively simple and be able to put these things on my slides, I stuck with this simple example. Uh, I mentioned this before. We're, we're not ruling out the fact that these uh, Fred Holm kernels could be uh, generalized functions. For example, if f1 of x, x1 is f of x delta x minus x1, uh, then uh, and g is similar, then we get this dynamics down here, which is more traditional dynamics. I'm going to assume that dynamics is the case again to keep the notation within bounds. And to find a linear feedback that stabilizes the system, we pose the infinite dimensional LQR problem here. So we choose two functions, q of x and r of x. q of x is non-negative definite, r of x is positive. q of x is non-negative, r of x is positive. Um, and uh, we can write them in Fred Holm form using delta functions. And um, we, this is a very simple Lagrangian, but our methods extend to more complicated ones. <clears throat> we complete the square again. Suppose we had a quadratic form in Fred Holm form. So P2 is some unknown kernel function, and we have this expression. If there is an optimal control sequence that takes z to zero, uh, then using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we get the following expression. So we add this quantity here to the condition, uh, to the uh, criterion to be minimized, the one we showed here. And we get this more complicated expression. <coughs> then we assume that P2, the Fred Holm kernel, quadratic kernel, satisfies Neumann boundary conditions. And that allows us to integrate by parts twice and put the uh, situation in a slightly different form where you see the two-dimensional Laplace and delta P2 appearing there. Now, as we did before, we want the integrand of the time integral. This is the time integral, starting from zero infinity out here to dt. We want this whole expression inside here, including the integrals with respect to x, or that dt is a typo, with respect to dx1 and dx2, we want all that to be zero. Uh, 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 this paper, I'm sorry, we want all that to be a perfect square. And here's the kind of perfect square we're talking about. So some unknown function k1 of x1, x3, uh, and we're squaring it through this weight function r that we had in the uh, criterion to be minimized, and we're not assuming that K1 is symmetric in its two arguments. So th this leads to an infinite dimensional LQR equations. Okay, so you see a quadratic term here in the unknown P2, you see a linear terms in P2, and then you have the formula for the optimal feedback. <coughs> 
Now, these equations are to be interpreted in the weak sense. Uh, we call them the first equation a Riccati PDE. And if we take any smooth functions, sufficiently smooth functions, and we integrate those equations over um, dx1, dx2, then we get uh, an equality. Similar equations have appeared in previous works of Leon's, Burns, Hulsing, Batten King, and others. So if P2 is a weak solution of the Riccati PDE, then it's the kernel of the degree two Fredholm form that is the quadratic part of the optimal cost. And then the closed loop dynamics takes this form, where K1 is like this. So a standard approach to solving Riccati PDEs is to expand P pi P2 in the eigenfunctions of the diffusion operator. So here's our diffusion operator, DDX2. We have Neumann value conditions. So the cosines uh, are the uh, eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues are minus I squared, pi squared from I going from zero up to infinity through integers from zero to infinity. The, this is an orthonormal family, which makes things nice. Uh, and look how fast the spectrum marches to infinity, negative infinity. So let's assume that P, P2 has an expansion in these eigenfunctions. So there's some infinite dimensional matrix here, capital Pi IJ, and we plug that this expression into the algebraic, the Riccati PDE, and we get an algebraic Riccati equation for uh, that. And I'll show you that in a minute in a particular example. Now, there's a second set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and those are the eigenvalues and the uh, eigenvectors of the linear closed loop dynamics. Now, if Q is strictly positive, uh, then, and we have some assumptions of stabilizability on the linear part of the nonlinear, the linear part of the nonlinear system, then uh, all these mu i's will be in the left half plane. And uh, the psi i's, of course, will not be necessarily an orthonormal family. Okay. So we solve these equations through degree two. When we're rolling, let's just go on to degree three. So let's assume that cubic part of the optimal cost has a Fredholm expression. And here it is. It's of this form here. Okay. And uh, we're going to differentiate that. Uh, and the, in the multiple equation here and integrate from zero time for time zero to plus infinity. And again, the fundamental theorem of calculus, if we assume this control trajectory actually does the stabilization that we're looking for, then we get uh, a zero quantity that we can add to the criterion to be minimized. We can collect terms and we get this form here, okay? So we have a cubic, uh, a, a three-dimensional Laplacian term. We have some linear feedback terms here, uh, terms here, and so on. And again, if we throw away uh, the integral signs and just interpret this equation as a weak equation, we get a weak linear elliptic PD for the symmetric function pi P3 of X1, X2, and X3, okay? And P3 is subject to Neumann boundary conditions. So what we saw in finite dimensions, it was desirable to make a change of coordinates into the eigenfunctions, the left eigenfunctions of the closed loop linear dynamics. Let's do that again. That in effectively is an expansion of P3 in those left eigenfunctions of the closed loop dynamics. And then the weak linear elliptic PDE becomes the triple sequence of equations that you see here. Okay. 
So this is the unknown in these equations. The other stuff is known data that we've already computed before. And if we assume that the linear quadratic part of the problem was stabilizable and detectable, then these eigenvalues are all in the strict left half plane. So no sum of them can be zero. And so this uniquely determines uh, these coefficients pi i, j, k, infinite family of coefficients i, j, k run from zero to infinity. Then we get the quadratic part of the optimal feedback from the second LQ HJB equation. And the higher degree terms are found in a familiar, similar fashion. So I'm going to show you a simple example of this. Uh, I'm modifying an example of Curtin and Swart, that wonderful book. Uh, I'm going to add this cubic nonlinearity. So it's a rod of length one with no flux boundary conditions. Distributed control, we can heat and cool anywhere we want, so it's a pretty powerful control system. And uh, we have some initial state here. And we have this quadratic nonlinearity. So in the notation we used before, f of x is zero, g of x is identically one, that's this coefficient here. f2 is a product of two delta functions in two different variables and all the other higher degree terms are zero. So we'll take a very simple plain vanilla feedback minimization problem. Uh, we'll minimize this integral of the L2 norm of Z and U from zero to infinity. And um, that leads to the Riccati PD becomes a, a Riccati, an actual Riccati equation for this infinite dimensional matrix, capital Pi again. This equation is identical to the one found by Curtin and Swart in their solution of the linear part of the problem, linear quadratic part of the problem. And they found that this is the solution. So now the eigenvalues, so the linear part of the optimal feedback is given like this. And here's the closed loop eigenvalues. Uh, they are all negative. This, the one that's least negative is minus one. All the other ones grow to infinity quite quickly. And what happens is that the left eigenvectors of the closed loop linear dynamics are the same as the left eigenvectors of um, the diffusion operator. But the basin of, as uh, of asymptotic stability is not particularly large. If we take a constant value for the initial temperature that's slightly higher than one, uh, then the quadratic term drives things non, uh, unstable. So we need higher degree feedback. So the Fredholm kernel of the cubic part, we again expand, before we were expanding in psi, but psi and phi are the same in this particular example. And we get this weak linear elliptic PDE. These are the resonance terms in the square. If you uh, in the, 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 from the squared terms. Uh, these equations, of course, don't lead to a symmetric solution if you just solve them brute force, so they have to be symmetrized. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. The Fredholm kernel of the quadratic part of the optimal cost is just minus three times P3. This three comes about because we're talking about cubic terms. <laughs> Uh, going to degree four, we didn't do this in general, but it, it can be done in general. Here it is in this example, we have a four, four indexed quantity pi, capital pi, and again, times the three of uh, the four eigenfunctions. And we are assuming that the quartic part of the optimal cost has a Fredholm kernel of this form. Then we get this equation for the algebraic the, uh, the uh, weak linear elliptic PDE that we have at degree four. We get this equation. Again, the sum of the mu's here has to be in the strict left half plane. So this stuff is already known, and this stuff is already known. So this equation uniquely determines pi ijkl. 
Um, again, we need to symmetrize the solution. And here's the Fred Holm kernel of the optimal cost, optimal feedback rather, the cubic part of the optimal feedback. Because of the very simple nature of this problem, it takes this very simple form. Now, the linear closed loop poles go to minus infinity quite fast. Mu three is almost minus 90. So we can do a Galerkin projection on the first three eigenfunctions. So we'll project on uh, phi zero, phi one, and phi two, and we'll call them zeta zero, zeta one, zeta two. So, uh, and the corresponding control will also project onto those first three eigenfunctions. Then the Galerkin projection leads to this uh, three-dimensional system. There's some quadratic nonlinearities that we got from the squaring term in the original problem. And um, we use the nonlinear systems toolbox to find the optimal cost to degree four for the three-dimensional Galerkin approximation. So here's what it looks like. Uh, Interestingly enough, all the coefficients are negative, uh, positive rather, that's somewhat unusual. I've never seen that happen before and when I've used the toolbox. But, and, but I, will not, I want to point out something to you. As you go further out, the coefficients start going down. So as these index, indices of the zetas, zeta one, zeta two, and so on, go down, uh, the um, coefficients go down. And the reason why for that is we're solving these equations. So if we're summing more and more variables, higher and higher, uh, I, uh, larger and larger, more and more negative uh, closed, closed loop eigenvalues, then when we divide by that, we get a smaller and smaller quantity. Now, by way of comparison, we can actually calculate for the infinite dimensional system. So Z0 is a sum of infinite sum of the eigenfunctions. And then we have those recursion formulas for the pi's, and this is what they turn out to be. Uh, this is exactly the same as for the Galerkin approximation, this part here. This is true. This is equals the part for the Galerkin approximation. This is a little smaller. This is a little smaller. This is a little smaller. Same thing happens here. This is exactly the same. These are a little smaller, but they're very similar to the Galerkin approximations. I don't fully understand why they are the discrepancies between the two solutions. Uh, I think it has something to do with the symmetrization process. There's no symmetrization necessary for these two terms. And these two terms, this, this was already symmetric. Uh, now, we just started the three-dimensional Galerkin approximation at a well outside the basin of stability with the linear closed-loop system. We use two feedbacks. The full cubic feedback is the one returned by the nonlinear system's feedback. That's feedback on all these variables and all their monomials up through degree three. But if we take a monomial in these variables and we differentiate it under the linear feedback, under the linear dynamics, it takes this form. So if the mu i's are very negative, this monomial decays extremely fast. So we can truncate, and we, trump, we chose to truncate any monomial where the sum of the mu i's corresponding to it was less than minus 20. So here are the two feedbacks. The three modes, the zero mode is in blue, the uh, first mode is in red, the second mode, uh, mode is in, uh, the, the zeta two is in, in green. The uh, dotted, the dashed is the partial feedback, which performs almost as well as the cubic, full cubic feedback. Um, notice the cubic feedback does so well that the First, the zeroth mode decays faster than the first mode, which is interesting. Okay. So because we have the ability to diagonalize all those Ulbricht equations, uh, we don't need to solve them all. 
we can just solve them for the monomials that are least stable. Now let's look at a boundary control version of this problem. Again, we'll keep the quadratic nonlinearity, uh, but we'll put the boundary control in here. And the question is, how do we model this? Okay. In our framework, there are at least three ways to do so. One is to define the G function, the G of X, that's the coefficient of the, co of, of the, the linear coefficient of the control to be very large, close to zero, and small elsewhere. And then we get this dynamics with a distributed dynamics, distributed control action rather, but most of the action doesn't happen. So in effect, we're taking G sub epsilon to be an approximation to a delta function at zero. Uh, the problem with this approach is when we go to the Riccati equations, G appears quadratically in the Riccati equation, as you remember. And therefore, we are in effect squaring an approximation to a delta function. Now, we wouldn't want to square a delta function, so I don't know why we would want to square an approximation to it. So I don't think this is the correct way to do this. We think a better approach is, again, to use a distributed control with, with one as its coefficient, but penalize heavily penalize any control actions that take place away from zero. So at zero, the penalty is just one. Away from zero, it's one over epsilon, where epsilon is a small number. So we seek to minimize this quadratic form here. And uh, there's also a third way of doing that, and that's just go to a finite difference screen. So we chose some integer n, we divided the interval from zero to one up into n sub intervals, and we let zeta i be z at xi, as i goes from zero up to n minus one. Uh, the nth z, z at, at one, is with the no flux boundary condition, z at one is equal to the next z at n minus one, so there's no sense there. So then we get the n-dimensional control dynamics that you see here. Uh, these are just sec centered second differences. Here's the quadratic nonlinearity. Here it is too. Uh, we use the nonlinear systems toolbox and we computed the tail polynomials of the optimal cost to degree four and the optimal feedback to degree three for n equals 20. So this is a large Hamilton-Jacobi Bellman equation, degree uh, state dimension. 20. It took eight minutes on the laptop. We started the simulations well outside the basin of stability for the linear part of the, uh, for the linear feedback. And the system stabilized in a little over a second. Here's, this is the L infinity norm of the 20 dimensional system. And so in one second, we're basically at zero. So I'll close with a little slogan, think mathematically, act computationally. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Jerome? Yes, thank you very much, Arthur. Are there any questions? It looks like there's a question from Wei Heng. So I will unmute you and you can go ahead and ask. Thank you. Oh, hello, Art. Uh, Hi, Wei. Uh, how are you doing? So anyway, uh, long time no see. Uh, uh, my question is that, you know, I'm trying to map this result of infinite dimensional case back to the finite dimensional case where, you know, when you solve these, um, uh, kind of homological equations. Uh, it has, uh, you know, in the finite dimensional case, you see this uh, uh, resonance terms. You know, if the eigenvalue satisfies certain kind of condition, then the higher order equation will have no solution and so on. So I kind of missing that part. That, does that something? No, it, do, it doesn't arrive in this case. These are not, these are not homological equations. 
but do you have like you know there there, there are no resonances because mm. if, if the if the linear feedback places all the closed loop eigenvalues in the left half plane then you don't no have no problem with solving it. Mm -hmm. So if the system, so if the LQR is stabilizable and detectable, uh, mm -hmm. resonance doesn't arrive. Okay, so before you place this uh, uh, pose, it can be unstable. But then after you place it on the left hand side, then you you avoid. That if if, if the linear control. part can put the poles on the left hand side, then there's no problem with the higher dimension, okay. higher degree stuff. Okay, thank you. I should add, if anybody wants to play with this toolbox, drop me an email. I'll be glad to send it to you. There are some uh, template problems that you could, uh, you know, you could put your own favorite in there. Um, so. Are there any more questions? Okay, in that case, thank you very much, Arthur, for your talk. Great, thank you. Thank you for your attention.